All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Sims, and we are pleased that you could all join us today for the lecture in our volume five of our 12 week neuropsychology didactic series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. We would like to thank our sponsors for their financial support for the series. Before we start, we wanna make sure everyone is aware of our YouTube channel. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available for your viewing pleasure. Be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures. Here are our disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen, and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and the YouTube channel later this week. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wasanga for today's lecture on specific learning disorders. Dr. Erica Wasanga is a pre pediatric neuropsychologist in the Department of Neuropsychology at Kennedy Krieger Department, or, sorry, Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Wasanga received her undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She earned her doctoral degree in clinical psychology from Washington University in St. Louis and completed her pre-doctoral internship in pediatric neuropsychology and pediatric psychology at the University of Minnesota Medical School. She then went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship in pediatric neuropsychology at Emory University School of Medicine and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. At Kennedy Krieger, she provides neuropsychological evaluation services for children and adolescents with a variety of medical and neurodevelopmental conditions primarily within the congenital and genetic conditions clinic. She is committed to providing patient and family-centered care to promote better outcomes for youth in diverse abilities and learning needs. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, go ahead and take it away with your slides. All right, well, thank you very much, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. I am very excited to be here today with Neuropsychology. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my slides. Let's see here. All right, can everyone see that? Okay. All right. Um, so today, let's see real quick. We will be um, as part of this no neuropsychology series. Um, which my understanding is that the theme of the lecture series is back to basics. So I wanted to make sure that um, for today's talk that we really ensure that everyone has a good, solid, fundamental understanding of some of the basic principles with regard to specific learning disorders. Uh, so that will include a review of the definition, prevalence, and outcome statistics for learning disorders, as well as discussion of the diagnostic processes involved with diagnosing a specific learning disorder and associated challenges with that diagnostic process. And we'll also be reviewing an overview of key features of each of the three main types of learning disorders, including a review of skills that are affected with each of those disorders and some neurobiological correlates that have been investigated. All right, um, so I have no disclosures to note or conflicts of interest. Okay, and to kick us off, so we'll start off by first just discussing what is a learning disorder. So a learning disorder, um, the widely accepted term for or definition for a learning disorder is a neurobiologically based difficulty with processing and with acquiring basic academic skills. Now, because there are many different academic skills that one can acquire throughout their lifetime, um, consensus has been to really focus in on the critical skills that are essential to um, then acquiring other skills secondarily. So this includes focusing on reading, writing, and math. And of note, these are skills that have to be explicitly taught during formal schooling. Um, and so when we're thinking about a learning disorder, we're really focusing in on, are we noticing deficits in the acquisition of these skills that are traditionally taught um, through a schooling setting? A learning disorder um, is believed to arise during the developmental period. Developmental period, um, we think about childhood. And so 
Learning disorders are typically first observed during the elementary school years after a child has had initial exposure to instruction in reading, writing, and math. Um, and then when we're starting to look to see, are we observing deficits in the acquisition of these skills? However, we also want to keep in mind that a learning disorder may not be observed until later in life. So that may include later in the middle or high school years. And in rare cases, learning disorder is not diagnosed for the first time until adulthood. All right. Now, other features of a learning disorder uh, is that it's really important to note that these represent deficits, not delays. So you may hear me use the term deficit. Um, and by that, I mean that these are difficulties that we're observing that they're persisting to some extent um, despite the provision of interventions. And we'll talk more about diagnostic processes in a moment, um, but for um, this community of trainees and learners in neuropsychology, when we're thinking about the DSM-5, um, we're quantifying this a little bit. So we're thinking about difficulties that have been persisting for at least six months. Learning disorders are not believed to spontaneously remit in most cases. They don't necessarily resolve fully. Um, we don't expect to see them magically go away or to be cured by it in any sense, but we will talk some about interventions later. And they occur across the full spectrum of intellectual disabilities. Um, so this is something that has been um, increasingly recognized throughout the psychological and medical and educational communities, um, which is that learning disorders can occur in children who have lower intellectual functioning or higher intellectual functioning. Um, you know, it's really, again, focusing in on these deficits with acquisition of academic skills, regardless of the child's intellectual abilities. And of course, it's important to consider exclusionary criteria. So deficits in a learning disorder are considered not better explained by the presence of an intellectual disability or sensory impairment um, or other mental or neurological disorders psychosocial adversity, lack of proficiency in language of academic instruction or inadequate academic instruction. All right, so now a bit about terminology. Um, and I think it's important to, to take some time here to really um, highlight this, you know, without, I understand that, um, you know, language is really important when we're talking about different diagnoses and different populations. Um, and the key point here I want to highlight on is the difference in terminology between a learning disorder and a learning disability. Um, you may find that throughout the talk, I may very well go back and forth between use of these terms. And in working with families, you may also hear different uses of these terms. And so some distinctions here. So the idea or use of the term disorder um, is something that's primarily used within the medical and psychological communities. And this is because with the term disorder, we're really focusing or highlighting how this is a condition or group of conditions that is thought to have a neurobiological basis for the deficits that we're observing. Um, and so that's in part why with the DSM-5, the diagnostic term that is used is a specific learning disorder. In contrast, the term disability or learning disability or even specific learning disability that key term of disability is something that is primarily used within legal and educational communities. Um, so it may be something that you come across in your conversations with families if they notice, for example, or if they report um, that their child has been diagnosed with a specific learning disability or classified as having a specific learning disability within the school system. And that term disability in contrast to the term disorder is really highlighting the legal status of the child's condition. So it's highlighting that they legally qualify for different accommodations or services to ensure that they have equal access to whatever it is that they are, they are pursuing. So for example, with education, there are federal laws um, that have been established, for example, under the Individual with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, or IDEA, uh, that are, exist to ensure that the child um, who has a disability and, or meets certain qualifications for a disability legally, then can have appropriate access to special education services. 
Um, when we think also about adults, we can think about federal laws as well. So for instance, federal law under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And this is something that ensures that in individuals who qualify as having a disability, which may include a learning disability, um, are able to access vocational rehabilitation services to ensure that um, they have appropriate services as needed for job seeking, employment, um, medical and psychological treatments, and other aspects of daily functioning. All right, so just a little bit about um, prevalence. So there has been a um, wonderful study that's been going on for some years. Um, the most recent iteration of this, this is the National Health Interview Survey, NHIS. Um, this is a survey of uh, families in the United States um, that was conducted through census interviewing of households. Um, again, the most recent data that we have is from 2009 to 2017. And in this survey, um, this survey included asking families about a number of different diagnoses that children in the household may have received, um, one of which was a question about learning disorder. So the question was, has a representative from the school or a health professional ever told you that your child has a learning disability? And in this study, about 7.74% um, of children in the study, and this was a large um, national study that included over 88,000 children, um, and about 7 to 8% of children were identified as having at some point having a learning disorder. Um, the lifetime prevalence for learning disorder, when we look at least um, within young adults and um, children aged 3 to 17, is about 9.7%. And you know, when we think about, again, implications for why we do want to be familiar with learning disorders in our practice, because they do have pretty significant implications for not only academic outcomes, but other outcomes. So for example, um, among high school students, adolescents who have a learning disorder have higher rates of grade retention, so needing to repeat a grade, and higher dropout rates relative to their peers. And that is associated with higher rates of incarceration, as well as lower post-secondary enrollment and attainment. Um, there are also some impacts associated with the labor force. So we think about restricted labor force participation, um, as well as individuals identified as having a learning disability often have lower earnings over their life. And children with learning disorder are also um, have reported to be more likely to demonstrate higher rates of depression, anxiety, and other mental health and behavioral problems. All right, so with regard to diagnostic models for a learning disorder, um, historically there have been a couple of different ways of that one might go about diagnosing a learning disorder. And I'm just gonna highlight a few here. Um, that I think are important to know from a historical perspective as well. So the first is the ability achievement discrepancy model. Um, this is a model that, um, it, that basically focuses in on the discrepancy in a child's um, testing profile, assessment profile, their cognitive skills, discrepancy between their intellectual functioning and their academic achievement. Um, so if a discrepancy of a, significant, of a certain magnitude was observed, then that child was classified as having a specific learning disorder. Now, this is a diagnostic model that has largely fallen out of fashion in part because of extensive research that has been done showing that um, it's just, it's not a very reliable method of diagnosing learning disorder. Um, and there are often people who are missed. So for example, you can imagine cases where a family or a student um, might be exhibiting, for instance, intellectual functioning within the below average or formerly known as borderline impaired range. Um, so IQs in the, the 70s, um, standard score of 70 or so, who is also showing um, you know, weaker skills or relatively weaker skills in certain aspects of academic functioning. Um, and sometimes these children would be 
overlooked by this model because of, there wasn't necessarily a large enough discrepancy. Um, commonly, the, the, the most commonly used approach then was about a one to 1.5 standard deviation discrepancy. Um, there's also been diagnostic models that's used throughout different school systems. And um, those of you who are familiar in, in working with children who are attending public schools will know that um, the use of, of this model may vary widely even within a school district or across school districts within a state. Um, but the response to intervention model or RTI model, um, it was, is a method that um, really focuses in on this idea that, okay, a specific learning disorder or learning disability is something that um, persists after the child has received intervention. So it involves a tier system of um, providing structured intervention for that child's specific academic weaknesses, and then waiting to see how they respond to that intervention before classifying them as having a learning disorder. Um, but there have been some definitely some um, controversy around the RTI model and use of the RTI model. Um, so for example, um, back in 2016, the US Department of Education released um, some federal notifications just to remind states that RTI strategies um, can sometimes and, and should not be used to delay or deny evaluation of a child. Um, so there were some cases where students, for example, were basically waiting to see how they would respond to an intervention, even though it seemed like they weren't doing too well and that evaluation process gets delayed. So the diagnostic model that's been used um, in, in approach that is more, um, maybe has more wide acceptance is really just a focus on the child's individual pattern of strengths and weaknesses. Um, so this is where as a neuropsychologist, our role really comes in um, where we're really focusing on how do we evaluate this child's particular pattern of not only academic strengths and weaknesses, but strengths, strengths and weaknesses in other cognitive areas to ensure that we're able to provide um, we're able to provide good recommendations to support intervention. And importantly, there's a need for a thorough clinical synthesis of the individual's history. Um, along with the assessment results. So that includes close collaboration between the clinician and the school um, to involve um, review of school records, gather information from the teacher to really understand how the child is functioning in the school setting and not only on test results. All right, so some challenges with the diagnostic practice of learning disorder. Um, as I alluded to before, there's definitely wide variability in how learning disorders are diagnosed. Um, differences across the country, within a state, um, across school districts. Um, one contributing factor and something just to be aware of is that there are often different roles between school psychologists and neuropsychologists in the community. Um, so for example, when we think about classifying a learning disorder and as I mentioned before, how we have to think about also the legal status or if a child um, meets the legal status of having a learning disability and someone as, who is eligible to receive special education services, um, that is something that can be done through assessment within the school setting by a school psychologist. Um, a neuropsychologist might be someone who might perform a more comprehensive assessment to better understand a child's pattern of strengths and weaknesses, but at the same time, all of that extra information may not necessarily be needed for, um, for understanding if the child meets that legal status of a disability. Other challenges include noting the high rates of comorbidity um, within learning disorders. So by this, I mean that learning disorders in, with impairment in those core academic skills, reading, writing, and math often co-occur um, and there's been estimates of rates of co-occurrence between 30 to 75%. Um, and it's unclear exactly why this is. There's been definitely different hypotheses about this. Um, so for example, perhaps this might reflect that even though we think about learning disorders as specific in nature, um, perhaps there is some kind of underlying core deficit involving learning. Um, but there's definitely high rates of 
comorbidity. This also could reflect differences or the variability in diagnostic processes. Um, another factor is to think about the limited inclusionary criteria that's involved with the diagnosis. Um, so at least currently on the, that DSM-5 model, um, there's not a criteria that involves looking at, okay, does a child also show a certain, um, you know, yes, they're showing deficits in some skill areas, but are there some areas that they are um, showing um, other types of weaknesses or other types of cognitive strengths? Another factor to consider is that in both clinical work and in research fields, there is less of an emphasis on the assessment and um, assessment and intervention for math and writing relative to reading skills. There have been a couple of different things, um, hypotheses to suggest that perhaps that's because um, at least in the US, there's definitely a, an emphasis on the role of reading for the workforce. Um, in general, in schools in the US, there's definitely more time spent on reading skills relative to math. Um, and that's been shown through some other public health work and educational work as well. But you know, I think one big limitation of our understanding of learning disorders is that we don't have a great sense, especially about the prevalence of math disorders and writing disorders relative to reading. And then there are also challenges of diagnosing learning disorders in adulthood that should be noticed here. Um, for example, adults who may not necessarily have access to all of their school records or academic records um, and may be relying just simply on retrospective memory of, you know, huh, did I take extra classes or receive extra instruction as a child when I was in school on any particular subject? Or do I ever recall anyone ever mentioning that I had a learning disorder? Or just simply reflecting on their own um, experience with learning and acquiring skills as a child. All right, so I also wanna to touch on some risk factors and shared features of learning disorders. Um, so as far as risk factors, it's, um, some of these first conditions have been noted to uh, commonly increase the risk for one to develop a learning disorder as they are older, so low birth weight. Um, you know, here we're thinking about children who are born, um, you know, weighing less than 2,500 grams. Also, children who are identified as having a speech delay or language disorder are more likely to later develop um, a length to later develop a learning disorder, particularly with regard to reading and or writing. Um, children who have ADHD um, are also more likely to then later develop a learning disorder. That's been most frequently studied, again, with a reading disorder. Um, as I mentioned before, learning disorders frequently co-occur together, um, but they also co-occur quite commonly with ADHD. And weaknesses in executive functioning are often observed on neuropsychological testing, um, as well as reports on standardized parent forms, such as the brief. Um, and particular weaknesses have been noted with working memory, inhibitory control, and organizational skills. All right, um, so some other information, and this has again, primarily been derived from that national um, health interview survey that I, referenced before. Um, so boys are more likely to be diagnosed or are reporting um, higher prevalences in boys than in girls. Um, unfortunately, there is not, at least to this date, um, much research, at, to my knowledge, really not minimal research um, regarding how learning disorders present across the gender spectrum. Um, but at least from this survey, um, it was reported that out of those who responded to the survey, again, that over 88,000 um, children, that about 9.56% of boys were identified as having a learning disorder and 5.85% of girls. And um, it's, I think, important to note that here, this was in just a, a survey of households. Um, it has been thought that, you know, so by surveying households, this suggests that perhaps there, there is something to the idea that it's occurring um, naturally more frequently in boys as compared to girls. 
Um, but it's also been recognized that when it comes to referring concerns um, that then lead to a diagnosis of a learning disorder that boys often present with additional referring concerns, um, particularly within the realms of externalizing conditions such as ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder that um, generate higher numbers of referrals that then contribute to higher numbers of um, these comorbid diagnoses such as learning disorders. Also looking at national data, non-Hispanic black children were more likely to be diagnosed with a learning disorder um, as compared to non-Hispanic white children or non-Hispanic children of other races or Hispanic children. There's also been noted to be a higher prevalence of learning disorder among those who have a lower parental education um, those who live in poverty or significantly below the poverty line, and those who live in rural areas as compared to urban areas, as well as children who are receiving um, only private health insurance or the uninsured, they are also more likely to be, um, or rather they are less likely to be diagnosed with a learning disorder than those who have received public health insurance. Um, and thinking about some of the racial and socioeconomic factors with learning disorder. Um, some things to note here is that there's definitely been some questions about um, you know, whether or not there, these numbers of non-Hispanic, especially with regard to non-Hispanic black children, Hispanic children and um, native and indigenous children, whether or not the numbers that we have might actually be an underestimation, even though they're representing the largest groups of those diagnosed with learning disorder. Um, there's also been a question of, are they actually an underestimation of those who would need the services through school? And then also important to note, which realizing I don't have here on the slide is that these children also, you know, again, I'm think referring to non-Hispanic black children, Hispanic children um, and indigenous and native American children also experience disparities when it comes to what happens after receiving the diagnosis of a learning disorder. Um, particularly with regard to placement in special education classes. Um, so these children are less likely to have time in the general education setting where one might um, reap some, some benefits of being around typically developing peers. They're more likely to be more exclusively placed in a special education setting or spend more of their day in a special education setting. And there's also some disparities that have been noted with regards to discipline. Um, so these children are more likely to receive um, what's considered um, more um, stricter forms of discipline, behavioral discipline for the same concerns um, as opposed to receiving other types of accommodations or supports. All right, so I'm gonna shift here and talk more about um, focusing really on the three subtypes of learning disorders that are focused in and highlighted in the DSM-5. So that includes reading disorders, writing disorders, and math disorders. Um, again, there's lots of different terminology that's used for each of these three types of disorders. Um, so for example, reading disorders, as a neuropsychologist, you may be making the diagnosis of a specific learning disorder with impairment in reading. Um, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to refer to them as a reading disorder. And reading disorders are the most common of the learning disorders. So they're accounting for, um, there's been estimates noting that they may account for about 80% of all learning disorders. All right, so some key features of reading disorder. Um, and I wanna just touch on some skills that are involved with reading as well as these might be areas of deficit that one might observe in a reading disorder. So, in a reading disorder, one might see a child who, or an adult who is struggling with word recognition. Um, so that can refer to, for example, the um, automaticity of reading and of recognizing words in rapid naming. There can also be weaknesses in reading fluency, which could include difficulties at the level of awareness of the relationship between the written language and the sounds or the graphemes and the phonemes and being able to decode those um, graphemes efficiently. We may also see difficulties with reading comprehension, 
Um, so for example, this might be a child who's able to read the text accurately, but is struggling to understand how the words or how the concepts are sequenced or the relationships within what they are reading um, or to be able to make inferences from what they are reading. In, within the realm of reading disorder research, there has been some limited support, um, mainly in, a, in the adult realm for a model called the double deficit model. So this is um, you know, suggesting that within a reading disorder, there might be um, some people who are showing single deficits in either rapid naming or in phonological awareness. Um, and there might be some other individuals who are showing deficits in both of these skills. And for those who are showing deficits in both of these skills, they're showing greater functional impairment. Also want to note here that um, a term that you may frequently hear and come across is dyslexia. Um, and dyslexia is a term that um, means many different things to different people. And I find that in working with children and families in schools, um, this is something that we usually have to take some time to explain, you know, why my report might say as a neuropsychologist might say specific learning disorder with impairment and reading, um, but a report from a medical provider that they receive may refer to dyslexia. Um, dyslexia is a term that's primarily used within the medical community, and it refers to a pretty specific constellation of concerns that um, is not exclusive to what you see here on the screen. So it can reflect concerns with um, the phonological decoding piece, but also with spelling and sometimes with aspects of math as well. And so dyslexia is something that can fall, you can think of it as falling under the umbrella of a reading disorder, but not all children who have a reading disorder have dyslexia. And then also to note here, so, you know, while, as I mentioned before, there are definitely, there are different areas of um, skills that can be impacted with a reading disorder, there are also cultural differences that have been observed across different cultures and different nations, depending on that culture's language orthography. Um, so by orthography, I'm referring here to the, the system um, of, of that language, the language system of um, the relationship between the written language and the spoken or the, the sounds of that language. So for example, English is a language that um, has a, a, what's been described by others as a very complicated orthography in the sense that it's not highly phonemic. Um, so while we have a written alphabet, the individual letters and combinations of those letters don't consistently map onto the sounds. So we have, you know, for example, many verbs or um, other forms of words that where the same combination of letters does not always sound the same. Um, and that's very different from other languages, for example, in Spanish, where we might see more consistent mappings of phonemes or sounds to combinations of letters. Um, and so what's commonly observed is that children who are English learners are, um, or are learning these skills, reading skills in English, um, but who have a reading disorder in English may show different patterns of difficulties. So for instance, um, children who are reading disorders with difficulty learning reading skills in English may be struggling to learn the correspondence between those letters and sounds. Um, but in contrast, in other types of languages, we may see that Children learn those pieces pretty quickly, but they're still struggling then with um, the reading fluency at the whole word level or with the rapid naming level and reading fluency. And that also holds true in comparing or contrasting um, English language learners and those who are um, learning to read in languages where um, rather than an alphabet, there is, um, or there are just other types of alphabets, there are character-based um, orthographies. And in those um, types of orthographies, there's usually less of the emphasis on the representation of the sounds, particularly with the characters. And so we also see differences in when the child is, is learning those connections. So lots of interesting cult cross-cultural work that's going on with reading disorders. All right, so some information about the neurobiological basis of reading disorders. So there's high heritability um, 
been estimated about a four to eight time greater risk of developing a reading disorder among those who have a first degree relative with a reading disorder. And there's been several gene candidates that have been proposed for reading disorder, um, far more than for the other types of learning disorders. But then again, it's important to also recognize here the potential impact of um, or interaction with environment and one's exposure to reading skills um, if one lives in a, in a household where, um, you know, perhaps if your parent as a first degree relative also has a reading disability, they may not necessarily be exposing you as much to those reading skills. There, you know, in looking at structural and functional neuroimaging studies, there have been, um, relative to the other learning disorders, many more neuroimaging studies of reading disability. Um, some of the primary findings that have come out of this body of research include findings of reduced gray matter volume, particularly in structures within the left hemisphere. Um, functionally, this has correlated with poor performance on reading achievement tests, um, naming of letters and, and naming of objects, as well as decoding tasks. It's also been evidence of hypoactivation in the left hemisphere um, in contrast with hyperactivation of certain right hemispheric structures. And I think a, another area which I'll focus in a little, a little bit more is disruptions in this left ventral frontotemporal parietal circuitry. Um, so here you can see here just um, a cartoon depiction of the left hemisphere. And some of the areas that have um, been noted to show hypoactivation in children and adults who have reading disorder include um, pr primarily posterior regions. So um, for example, we see differences. Oh, sorry about that. So for example, we see primarily differences within the left inferior parietal cortex. Um, so here thinking about anchor gyrus near the parietal temporal occipital junction region. Um, and that's an area that's receiving information from the visual cortex and passing it forward um, and, and anteriorly to Wernicke's area and to other language processing areas. We also see differences and there's been a lot of studies focusing on the inferior occipital temporal region, um, particularly with the fusiform gyrus, which is, um, includes an area that's known as the visual word form area. Um, and there's been some interesting studies looking at the visual word form area and different patterns of activation here. Um, so it tends to be activated when visual input um, or written input is, is something that has to be mapped to a phonological representation. So differences in reading or in perceiving um, written words versus other types of, of visual stimuli. Um, and there's also differences in activation depending on if what's being perceived is a word or a letter. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we discuss writing disorders. Um, also changes in some other left hemispheric structures, um, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on and talk about writing disorders. So some key features of writing disorders include difficulties or um, deficits in the expression or the quality of written expression. Um, so this may or may not include challenges with the actual fine motor output with handwriting. Um, we can sometimes see if, if we see challenges with handwriting, you may see the term dysgraphia used to describe those challenges or developmental dysgraphia if it's observed um, in, in children who are having challenges acquiring handwriting skills. We can also see challenges with spelling, with grammar, with the fluency of one's written output, or at the composition level, we can think about difficulties with organizing um, sentences to put together essays or, or longer um, written expression. So some neurological bases of writing disorders. Um, I think the important thing to note here is that there are definitely relatively fewer studies of writing disorder observed in isolation. It's commonly observed either in combination with a reading disorder, thinking about this idea of dyslexia and, and challenges with both reading to coding and with spelling. Um, but there have been some interesting neuroimaging studies that have been done with um, 
either pre-literate children, so very young children who as part of the study are instructed to copy um, written information or with adults um, who do not have a learning disorder. And there's been differences observed in activation, again, of that visual word form area that I alluded to before, um, where we see that posterior region of the visual word form area um, sees greater activation with processes of words um, in contrast with the anterior region of the visual word form area seeing greater activation when single letters are processed. And the interesting thing here is that when that anterior region is activated, we also see higher rates of co-activation of motor regions. Um, so for example, recruitment of an area in the right middle frontal gyrus that's known as Exner's area. And it's thought that this is something that has been, um, it, it, that the advantage here is that when we think about letters, we may have to think more about the motor formation, um, but it's not necessarily advantageous to think about um, or to plan for motor formation of a whole word as contrast to a letter. All right, and so with math disorders, um, math disorders are also in, in contrast or in comparison with reading disorders, they are relatively less studied. Um, and I think one of the challenges with a math disorder is that there's definitely, um, with, with math, there is definitely, um, the, a greater recognition, I think, that we have to consider both math or number-specific skills, um, but then also the role of other cognitive skills that might be supporting one's ability or functioning in math. Um, but to look at the math-solving skills in particular, we can think about challenges with acquisition of number sense. Um, so this includes, for example, the ability to understand um, that a group um, of pictures or objects represents a set, um, and that this is something that um, can be used to represent quantities of information so that one can then estimate or compare the magnitude of, of these quantities. Um, kind of a difficult term to define number sense, but if you see the term dyscalcul dyscalculia or developmental dyscalculia, it may be referring to challenges with that initial acquisition of number sense that's needed as a foundation to then be able to carry out these other math skills, such as counting or use of different symbols or signs for um, manipulating quantities or understanding quantities. For memorization of math facts, um, so that's thinking about your times tables, for example, for accurate or fluent calculation or for math problem solving. All right, and in thinking about neurobiological bases for math disorder. Um, so here we're thinking in contrast with um, reading and writing disorders, which are really considered disorders of language processing. Um, neuroimaging studies, while there are relatively few of them that have looked at math disorder in isolation, those that exist, and there was actually a great review back in 2013 that reviewed different types of neuroimaging studies in math disorder, have found that there is a distinction in the circuitry involved between math and reading. Um, we notably see in math disorder disruptions in this right dorsal frontal parietal circuitry. Um, and one great developmental finding that has been observed is that in younger children who have a math disorder, um, and in fact, it, I shouldn't say who have a math disorder, in younger children in general, typically developing or with a math disorder, we often see that they are when performing math tasks, that they um, are showing greater activation of the prefrontal cortex. But when we then look at adolescents who are typically developing or adults, we are no longer seeing that prefrontal activation or in as great of a detail or as great of an extent. Um, and it's thought that really what that's reflecting is that as one becomes um, more proficient with math skills, then we rely less on recruitment of our executive functioning skills, such as working memory, for things like updating our numbers while we're working problems. Um, I also just want to highlight here that there are a number of different genetic and congenital conditions that are associated with higher rates of math disorder. Um, so that includes, I just have a brief list here that includes Turner syndrome and Fragile X syndrome, both of which 
um, are um, syndromes associated with changes to the X, to one of the X chromosomes. Um, DeGeorge syndrome, which is associated with a microdeletion on chromosome 22. And spina bifida and hydrocephalus, those are congenital conditions where we do see higher rates of challenges with math skills. Um, so, you know, things I think, especially um, if you're working with pediatric populations, um, things to look out for is going to be, you know, asking about the child's proficiency with math. All right, so in final minutes here, I just want to, um, just want to highlight, you know, thinking about as a neuropsychologist, what are some of the things that are in my mind when working with families who, um, are suspected of having, or the child suspected of having a learning disorder has been identified as having a learning disorder. You know, really, we, you know, part of our role is to help identify those children who are indeed in need of early intervention services. Um, and I think here, the key piece is that, you know, as I mentioned before, while we have this distinction between a learning disorder and a learning disability in that legal sense, um, you know, we can, through our assessment, perhaps identify those who would then qualify in the legal sense for meeting criteria for a specific learning disability, and then um, being eligible for special education services through school, or being eligible for accommodations in the workforce or in college. Um, so we're part of that. Um, the, the part of the system that's involved in helping to identify those who are in need of intervention. And part of that involves analysis of the child's or the individual's strengths and weaknesses. Um, so for example, we can think about um, different types of error types that a person might be making. So for example, a child who is showing um, challenges with math, are they making errors that are related to um, procedural aspects of computation, so sequencing of steps? Are there errors more related to visual spatial um, processing skills or other types of skills. Um, and by observe, making those observations and, and quantifying that, we can then help guide intervention planning. So whether that's with school, with college, or with work. Um, part of our role as neuropsychologists is, of course, communicating all of that information with the relevant parties um, and, and making sure that we're making really clear and tailored recommendations for accommodations and helping that family or that individual um, get access to the services that they need. So with that, um, since we are coming up near the end of time, I'm gonna pause here, um, but I wanna thank everyone for your time and attention. Um, and I hope that this has been helpful um, again and just thinking about an overview of learning disorders as part of this Back to Basics series. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, and so I'll just go through a few of them. Um, so first question, which I'm really interested in the answer as well. So how should neuropsychologists conceptualize patients with specific learning disorder disorders or attentional deficits in the context of dementia evaluations? For example, if someone has ADHD and now they are thought to have some sort of neurodegenerative or dementing process, how do you go about parsing out what it what is what or making sure you aren't over or under pathologizing like scores on uh, attention measures, for instance? Yeah, that's I a great <laughs> that's a great question. It really is. Um, and so, you know, I, I should first say, you know, as a, as a pediatric neuropsychologist, I do not have in my current practice, I'm, I'm not working with older adults for whom dementia would be a diagnostic question. Um, but from, you know, I think the important thing to consider is this question of functional decline with dementia. So for example, or with mild cognitive impairment. So, you know, I think this question really highlights the importance of a need for a very thorough clinical interview and review of records to the extent possible. So trying to gather as much information as one can about pre-morbid functioning. Um, so, you know, I always recommend to people, for, to clinicians who work with people across the lifespan, so whether that's with children or with older adults, to try and gather as much informant reports as you can, um, just to, 
to ensure that you have the best understanding of that person's early functioning. Um, and, and then from there to then estimate, okay, where has there been a functional decline? Is, has there been a functional decline? Um, because that decline would suggest that there's something else going on, such as a dementia. Um, learning disorders and ADHD in contrast tend to be fairly stable across um, the lifespan. And so if we're seeing any kind of decline that suggests that there's something else neurologically going on. And um, also people at the age range that we typically be evaluating for dementia may not have been assessed for things um, like the learning disorders you've discussed. So yeah, it, it's good to make sure to ask them about it, even if they didn't necessarily get the diagnosis. Um, and so we have a few more questions. So is there any relationship between the presence of trauma and the likelihood of getting diagnosed with a learning disorder? Oh, that is, that is a really great question. Um, so I, I did recently see, um, so, oh, I wonder if I can just share this. So the um, National Center, I wanna make sure I get their acronym correct. The National Center for Learning Disabilities, um, they release, every so often they release a report on the state of learning disabilities. Um, and their data is exclusive to students and to school age children. So I, I can't really, um, I, I am not, I'm unfamiliar with thinking about lifetime prevalence as relates to trauma and learning disabilities, but they actually did release some data regarding um, the frequency of adverse child experiences, so ACEs. Um, so that includes witnessing, um, being a direct victim or witness of violence or economic hardship or other types of um, other types of adverse childhood experiences that students who experience four or more ACEs were found to be 32 times more likely to be diagnosed with learning or behavioral challenges. And that was based on their national survey. Um, that was a separate national survey from the one I referenced before, um, but was all, I should note that all of that data was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so yes, there does seem to be a relationship between trauma and learning disabilities. It's, it's exa not exactly clear what the nature of that relationship is, if it's um, causal associational, but um, that is an area of emerging research. Cool. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So interesting. Um, and this uh, person says, in their experience, writing disorders tend to be secondary to dyslexia, ADHD, ASD, and other motor disorders. And they're wondering if that's your experience as well. Yeah, yeah, I would say that that has been anecdotally, that has been my experience as well. It's been rare that I've seen, but I have seen on occasion students who have a specific learning disorder in writing and, and they don't have a, they, they don't have a comorbid um, reading or math disorder. Um, you know, I think writing disorders are very, very understudied, unfortunately, um, to the extent that in the limited research that exists, you'll often see reference to the, this term, oh, they are like writing disorders represent the silent majority or the unforgotten learning disorder. Um, and I think part of it is because there's also, when I think at least in, in my role, there's definitely challenges to assessing a writing disorder. Um, you know, logistically, when we think about our neuropsychological battery or testing battery, writing tests take longer than reading and math tests typically. I think that's, that's one feature. Um, you know, there's also, you know, we can think about working with populations for whom, yes, there's fine motor impairment. And so that's another, another factor that we want to consider. Um, but yeah, so that has been my experience anecdotally where it's secondary, but it's not always the case. And I think we don't have good estimates of how frequently that's occurring on its own. Okay, so we have lots of questions coming in, so we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, so can you uh, speak a little bit about the neurocognitive profile expected in a reading disorder? For example, what would their working memory, immediate and delay recall look like? Yeah, so I think, um, again, it's, it's thinking about, um, you know, we also have to keep in mind, are we looking at someone who has a reading disorder in isolation of, of, of other conditions? But um, yes, yeah, so we do typically see challenges with 
um, language-based skills. So again, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that for a reading disorder, it's really thought of as not only just reading disorder, but it's in some senses a disorder of language processing. So we do see differences on other verbal tasks, including verbal recall, um, executive functioning tasks. Um, so particularly with regard to inhibitory control, we might see differences in um, working memory as well. And then differences in processing speed are sometimes also observed. Um, that's the case across learning disorders. And there's been um, some, some thought that perhaps processing speed in, in a sense might represent a possible core underlying deficit across learning disorders may not be the only one, um, but that's something that is commonly observed as well. And I'll just kind of make one of these questions a little bit more general, but for, for people who have maybe a lower um, functioning or global cognitive deficits, how do you parse out that from a learning disorder um, in the context of someone who may have like borderline intellectual functioning? Yeah, so for someone who has, so right, because it's important, we, we wanna make sure that we're not, um, we wanna make sure that it is the better explanation for the child or for the person's um, learning deficits, is it really better explained by intellectual disability? Um, it is possible to, there, you know, it is possible in some cases for a person to have an intellectual disability and a specific learning disorder. Um, if say their learning deficits are even, you know, if we're looking at, um, if we're looking at them in the context of their other skills, if we, if we are seeing, you know, a pretty significant discrepancy between their academic skills and their other skills, and that is possible. Um, you know, it's also important though to consider the extent of instruction that the person has had in that area of academics functioning. Um, and, and so, for example, um, if we're thinking about a, a student with intellectual disability who, um, you know, because of the nature of their intellectual disability, the, the grade level, so to speak, of academic instruction that they've been exposed to is at a certain point, um, and that's where their skill level is as well in that academic skill, then that they wouldn't be someone who would necessarily meet for specific learning disorder. So it can be tricky to parse apart for sure. Um, and I think again, gathering information from, from teachers where we can when we're working with schools um, to find out you know, how, what, what, what type of instruction has been provided, what type of intervention, um, how has the child responded to that? Are they meeting what we would expect even in the context of this intellectual disability or not? Okay, and also um, for the context of the pandemic, how have you been conceptualizing SLD with changes in schooling uh, during the pandemic? Yes, yeah, this is a this is a great point. And actually, um, you know, those on the talk may have seen, I, I, I saw just this morning through one of the neuropsychology listservs, someone was circulating a, a recent article um, just about this idea of like, you know, we, we, we need to think about just an opinion piece, we need to think about um, changing how we are conceptualizing a learning disorder and that diagnosis during the pandemic, you know, right, because of virtual learning, because of disruptions in learning, um, disruptions in, you know, so I think about a couple things. One, disruption in the natural or the usual screening processes for identifying someone who is at risk for a learning disorder, right? So like at the very early end, we think about, you know, there's been postponement or delays in, for example, just screening children who might have a speech or language delay that would then put them at risk for having a learning disorder later. Um, we can think about a child who, because they've missed a lot of school, they, they may not, you know, it may be unclear that um, they are showing weaknesses that are above and beyond simple absence to school. Um, you can also think about postponement in the assessment process, both through school and outside of school and those delays there. And so there's been a call for, you know, maybe we need to think about um, when it comes to this idea of there being the presence of a persistent deficit, maybe we need to think about 
including at least like a provisional diagnosis or at least um, you know, some kind of acknowledgement that maybe this is some other type of unspecified neurodevelopmental disorder um, to at least start the process rolling for follow-up monitoring or interventions so that we don't let anyone really fall through the cracks. But yeah, it is definitely a challenge. Um, and one that I do think that school personnel and medical personnel and, and, and psychologists that we all recognize um, and are just trying to figure out the best way of handling it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for answering all those questions and your great presentation today. We appreciate you joining us. Um, and for everybody else, we're going to be having um, another uh, didactic series uh, continues next week. So April 18th at 4 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be talking about FTD syndrome. So please join us then. Thank you again. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.